My name is Steve Souders. I work here at Google on making the internet faster. And periodically, we invite speakers who are well known in this field to come and give presentations. I met Ismael like a year and a half ago down in LA at a performance meetup that we did down there, uh, kind of a predecessor to the many metro meetups that are uh, performance meetups that are happening now. And he worked at Emmons.com, was doing some really awesome stuff. They did a talk there. And then um, he uh, made a proposal for Velocity last year and spoke there. So we've crossed paths a few times. And he's been working with Ryan Hickman here at Google on some uh, joint efforts. And so Ryan invited him up here to give a talk on what uh, Edmunds.com has been doing around improving performance. And one of the things that, uh, you know, the reason I invited Ismail to speak at Velocity last year was they've done a lot of work on ads. And, um, you know, I think the performance of ads is really important. I'm, I've been excited to see announcements here at Google about improvements we're doing with our ad snippets. And it, there's ad snippets and there's also ad content. And it's really hard to wrangle both of those, um, especially for a publisher who doesn't own any of those pieces. And so I think the work that um, Ismail and his team have done at Edmunds.com is really important. Um, so I'm excited to have him here. Ismail El Sharif from Edmunds.com, please help me welcome him. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Ryan. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay, perfect. Well, I'm really excited to be here. I mean, this, what, a, what a crowd, what a turnout. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of intimidated now. But uh, I'm really excited to be here and to share with you the Edmunds experience in terms of performance. And I want this to be an interactive session, so please, if you have a question, just you know, raise your hand and, 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 and ask it. And I do realize this is an after lunch session, so I'm gonna try not to bore you too much, you know, because I know a lot, of, a lot of you are gonna go into a food-induced coma, so hopefully I won't, I won't be contributing to that. So, a little bit about me. My name is Ismail Sharif. I've been with Edmonds for three years now. I came on board to work on the front-end department, re-architect the front-end with reusability and modularity in mind, and now I'm spearheading the Edmunds platform or open platform initiative. So let's get right into it. Today we're going to be talking about how we were able to achieve these results. We were able to get our onload to fire from, from 8.4 seconds to actually 1.9 seconds, which is 77%, on average, 80% reduction in, uh, on onload. And our page views increased by 20%, our uh, bounce rate decreased by 4%, and our ad impression uh, variance decreased by 3%. So how we were able to do that, that's what we're gonna be talking about today. So by show of hands, how many of you know Edmunds.com? Wow, this is impressive, I'm really, this is great. So I'm really happy about that. So let me tell you a little bit more about Edmunds.com. We are uh, an, an automotive research company. We've been online since 1995. We have three properties. The first property is Edmunds.com, which is our main, which is our bread and butter, basically. That's our automotive research company. The second property we have is InsideLine.com, and that's our automotive enthusiast uh, site. And actually, all the car photos that you're seeing in this presentation come from InsideLine.com. So if you're into cars and into, into photography, go there. Our third property is uh, AutoObserver.com, which is basically automotive news and research. And it's a blog that we, that we own. On average, on Edmunds.com uh, proper, we get between, 200, uh, between 150 to 200 million page views a month, which corresponds to 15 to 20 million unique visitors a month. So we pretty high volume site. Our revenue model is based on ad impressions and leads, which is converting uh, users to talk to dealers and, and get a transaction going that way. So before I delve into what we did and the three amazing uh, steps that we took to achieve performance on the front end and, and, and yield all these results I talked about in the previous slide, let's go a little bit um, back in history to talk about what the site looked like. This is what our homepage on admins.com looked like since 2006. That was a big redesign that we did back then. 
you know, aesthetically, it's, you know, let's just face it, it's not the most attractive site uh, uh, that we had, but um, it worked really well. Our servers uh, were able to handle the load that we got pretty well. Uh, our pages did not time out for our users. So we thought at the time that we were doing really well. Revenue was up, so that it, was, it was cool. We, we loved it. Nothing was going on. When I came on board, we did work on creating reusable components so we can use the same page component on different pages without recreating, rebuilt, recreating the wheel, if you will. But that was about it, you know, combining JavaScript simple stuff. But whenever we had a problem with a page slowing down, we always looked at the back end. We always looked at Apache, our uh, servlets, our JSPs. But then, while we were doing that stuff, Steve Souders came up with, um, or came out with the 14 rules for page performance. And he actually connected the dots between performance and the front end architecture. And he made a statement that 95% of performance is really a front end job or a front end responsibility. So that kind of resonated with us. And we were like, okay, we were familiar with Firebug and, and the waterfall and the resources. You know, we kind of knew that HTTP requests, you need as, as little of those as possible on your page. But it wasn't until those 14 rules came out that the, the picture was really clear for us. And then organizations like Amazon, like Facebook, like you guys here at Google, you're, you're lucky to, to have the ability and the capacity to do these controlled experiments where you can actually con uh, relate performance to the bottom line, which is a, a luxury that we didn't have as, as a publisher. So we looked at the results and we started thinking really seriously about how does our site fare when it comes to performance. So instead of looking at our site and back end and seeing the load and all of that stuff, we looked, this is a real picture now. This is how we were looking at our site, which is not really the best picture in the world. Our waterfall doesn't look really good. Like if you look at the blue line, that's the onload event. It's firing in 8.4 seconds, really not that great. And our score here is, is really bad. So the site condition was really abysmal in terms of um, things that needed to be optimized. We had way too many HTTP requests. And most of those requests were blocking requests. Um, the pages were perceived to be slow to the end user because the onload event would fire in 8.4 seconds, which, which still wasn't ideal. And to, to top it off, we had a lot of components on the page that were, um, that were triggered by the onload event firing. So we had all of these critical components that would only be rendered when the onload event fires. So if the onload event fires in 8.4 seconds, that means that those components are not going to be seen for 8.4 seconds, which was really, really bad. Of course, domain sharding and external factors like ads, videos, uh, analytics, and all of these other resources that we're serving from other, other domains were contributing to that problem as well. So we were really excited about what we heard Steve talk about, the industry, the community at large talk, talk about, and we felt that there's so much that could be done here. So what are we gonna do? We started tinkering a little bit, and I remember two engineers from, uh, from Edmonds at the time, Real de Prez and Ilan Rubanovic, they got together because at the time, you have to remember, we were evangelizing all the best practices for page performance, talking about it, whiteboarding the whole nine yards. We were doing it all, but without real results. Like, we were not doing anything because, you know, it's legacy. We couldn't really do much. But these two engineers got together and they said, you know what, let's take a look at our CDN and the resources that we're providing uh, that the CDN is serving on our pages. And they looked at caching. So they did, in, I, sw I swear, uh, in, in a day, I, maybe a day and a half, they got together, looked at the configuration of Akamai, tweaked it a little bit, added uh, the expires header, and removed e tags, and we served it for a week. The results were astounding. I, we just could not, could not believe the results, to be honest. And I don't think they had in mind the results when they were playing around with, with the Akamai configuration. They just wanted to do something. They wanted to apply one of the, the rules and the best practices to what we have. And that was kind of like a quick win for us. But the results were, were just amazing. Third of the traffic that we had coming from Akamai completely disappeared. Gone. 
And they add, by the way, they added that only to images, CSS files, and JS files. And the expires um, header was only for 24 hours. So third of the traffic was gone, completely gone. It was actually, it was so good that we were able to negotiate a two year free video streaming with Akamai at no additional cost. I mean, that's just incredible. For us, I, I thought that was, oh my God, this is, this is it. We need to apply more of those rules to, uh, to our legacy site. But this is one of the things like, if you're a publisher, and you are stuck with a proprietary CMS and you don't have a whole lot of leeway in terms of what you can do in your infrastructure, there are ways to, there are ways to, uh, to make quick gains in your, in your performance and on your pages to, and that will get you a lot, of, a lot of bang for your buck. So we started looking at all the other rules, but we couldn't do much because legacy was, was complicated. We're stuck with uh, the CMS that we bought a couple of years back, and the way you put components and rendered the page was, was a little, um, it was unfriendly to uh, just put it that way. So we had a lot of, we couldn't do much with that. But fortunately, and in the end of 2008, I, I remember September 2008, we had an initiative at Edmonds to re-architect and redesign one of our properties uh, InsideLine.com, the automotive enthusiast property. And that's when the engineering team thought, okay, you know what, this is it. This is our opportunity to do something real, to apply all of these learnings that we, uh, everybody's talking about that we know are, are important for our site into this redesign and into this re-architecture. And the executives really were all behind us because in a way, in, the InsideLine redesign was a low risk uh, opportunity for us. So if we failed completely, it would not impact our bread. It wasn't our bread and butter, so it would not impact our revenue as much as uh, Edmunds.com would, for example. But at the same time, this re-architecture and redesign that we're going to come up with, it had to apply to Edmunds.com and all our other properties. So this basically were, was our lab, like Edmunds Labs, if you will, the, to experiment around with that. And, and we took it. For us, the, some of the main objectives for the redesign were performance, rich content, and high revenue. Sp rich content is basically specific to uh, the inside line redesign because of the, the, photog the photography that we had, the, the videos that we had, and all of that stuff. But performance, for sure. We wanted our pages to be as fast as possible. How we, we kind of had an idea how to do it, learning from the community, from you guys, and, but we, we didn't know how we're going to do it for us, for our specific use cases. And of course, we could not impact revenue for the um, inside line redesign revenue, uh, the inside line site revenue. But, but by, that, by that time, we had a mindset already established from everything that we learned and everything that we've read, we know now that faster pages yield better user experience, and a better user experience invariably lead to a higher revenue. So that's, that's where we're at. But as, you could, as I showed you from the admins.com site condition, we're plagued by a lot of HTTP requests that we had. So we had to kind of reconcile that. How are we going to achieve performance when we have like a bajillion resources called on a page? When we looked at the kinds of HTTP requests that were being made on a page on admins.com and insideline.com and autoobserver, don't forget this architecture had to apply to all our assets, right? So we took a look and we noticed that, of course, I mean, it was just a no-brainer, but we needed to validate that the kinds of requests were requests made to admins.com or admins.com controlled domains, and requests that are made to third-party domains, like doubleclick.net, like omniture.net or .com, like uh, brightcove.com, all of these third-party domains that are part of our page, but we have no control over. So for our own requests, we know pretty much what to do. Combine requests, uh, use uh, sprites for images, use data URIs for images when appropriate, uh, call the HTTP, uh, call the JavaScript request at the bottom of the page. We knew what to do with that. But for third party, we had, we had the limited ability of what to do. 
So we looked at the third party requests and how they existed on our pages. They existed in two forms, JavaScript and iframe. And from our own experience with each form, we listed the pros and cons to each. Uh, there's an anecdote that I always like to share, which is, you know, in hindsight, it's funny, but at the time it was not really. In summer of 2008, we had uh, a page, one of our main, very important critical pages, actually, would not render in IE. It would just, half the page would render, and the rest would just not show up. And actually, the browser would crash. And we had no idea what was going on. We spent two weeks trying to disable components and, you know, is it a backend? Looked at our servlets and nothing was going, you know, those were fine. We just had no idea what was going on. It, we ended up learning, obviously, after two weeks of constant research and, and playing around with the page, that we had an ad, the second ad on the page, that was creating a memory leak in IE and the whole browser was just freezing. And that was like, okay, that's great now. Because we didn't have an operate, we didn't have a way of disabling the ads to see how the page would, would behave with, with the ads and without the ads. So it took us two weeks actually to get to that point where we removed that specific ad and reload the page and oh, the page worked well. And then we, we found out that that specific asset that the ad is serving was defective and we, you know, we went through that channel and solved it. But it took us two weeks to do that, which was not good of two weeks of my time and my team's time. Go ahead. So the question is, was the, uh, the, the asset uh, flash? I, be I believe it was. I, be I think it was one of those expandable ads. You know, I tried, I'm blocking it out of my memory at this point. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it was bad. And we decided that, you know, we cannot have this happen with the redesign. And if that should happen, we need to find that out pretty quickly. We, we cannot afford to spend two, two weeks of everyone's time on this problem. So part of, the, part of that problem was access to DOM, right? That, that JavaScript ad completely hosed the JavaScript engine on our page. And as a result of that, you know, the page died. Maybe it would have been different if it was in an iframe, you know, a completely sandboxed experience. Maybe, I don't know. But the fact that JavaScript ads have access to DOM, use document.write, and all of these things that we've had, us at Edmonds, I'm not saying the, the world at, at large, but us at Edmonds, we had a problem with, we needed to avoid that. So that was a con. The pros, of course, is you, know, you have richer content. So we looked at the two forms and how they exist on our site. We, we found that most of the third party requests that we had on the site, fall into the JavaScript world, and not a whole lot in the iframe world, even though we would have loved them to be in the iframe world, because you know very, very little uh, cons and a, a lot of pros to it. But we noticed that the ads and the widgets that we use kind of use both formats. And since we have a problem with ads to begin with, we, we focus, kind of focus on the ads uh, in particular, to solve the ads, I mean. So our particular challenge wasn't page performance versus HTTP requests, it was really page performance versus third party requests. And that's when, when we started thinking of third party as these two guys that we needed to conquer, right? So we have this iframed guy and this JavaScript dude that we needed to kind of like put in line. But the, the, the iframe guy was agreeable, you know, you could lazy load him, you can, you can, you can play around with, you know, he, can, he plays nice with, with our site, with our pages. But the JavaScript guy was kind of like um, problematic and there was not a whole lot that we could do with that. So we tried to break him, tried to control him. For us, the main problems that we had with JavaScript ads or JavaScript third party requests was the document.write. That was at that time. So we tried to override the document.write which worked great, you know, we spent a couple of days working on that and it was great until we ran into some ads that had nested document.writes. And then we were like, okay, if we're caching that string that's supposed to be spitting out, spit out by the document.write, we really don't want another document.write in there. So we thought, okay, maybe we can substitute that and inject, you know, get the, the result for that second document.write and, and grab the result 
of that and inject it in the string, in the cache string, it turned into be this nightmare for us that we couldn't really, um, we couldn't really solve. So we said, you know what, we're just going to skip that. We have no time to override anything at this point. So the second one, which really was the attempt that I was really excited about, was to create an, a hidden iframe on our page that exists within our own domain, and then load that JavaScript, JavaScript ad in the iframe, and then when, when it's done loading, communicate back with the parent page and have us you know, grab it and put it on the, on, on, on the page where it's supposed to be. That was great in Firefox and in Chrome and Safari and all of these browsers, but in IE was a little problematic. It worked most of the time, but not all the time, and we couldn't really risk you know, putting out a, a solution that wasn't 100% working. For some reason in IE, and please correct me if I'm wrong, I would love to, to hear if you guys worked with this. In IE, the, the iframe onload event sometimes is buggy for some reason or it doesn't always fire, but almost 20 to 30% of the time when we experiment, when we load tested it, it would just not fire. And we know that the ad works properly. So I'm not really sure what's going on. I was really excited about this attempt, but we decided to ignore it for that. So that basically, you know, we tried to break the JavaScript, uh, the third party JavaScript calls, and we failed miserably. That's when we decided, you know what, let's take a step back and take a look at what we're trying to do here. We're trying to make our pages faster, right? So let's control, let's, let's focus on the stuff that we have control over and make that as fast as possible and find a way to mitigate the impact of the other stuff that we have no control over without, without controlling it per se. You know, just find a way around it to make it work with the page, but without controlling it, control its internals. So that brings me to our first amazing step that we came up with, which is that you cannot control everything, and it's, it's okay. You don't have to control everything. But that was an amazing revelation, if you will, because the moment we understood that, it made us really focus on the stuff that we have control over without worrying too much about the other stuff. And when you look at the percentage or the ratio of third party uh, requests in, in, in relation to requests that we have uh, control over, actually from the old sites to the new sites, the ratio increased because we reduced the number of requests that are being made from our own domain. So the ratio of the, of the third party requests increased. And can you imagine trying to control 40 different ways of, 40% of, of different ways of handling requests on your page? We, was just, we didn't have the capacity or the resources to do that because if we came up with a solution for a particular third party request that did not work with the other and, you know, and, and if the third party changed the way they're doing things and we had to kind of change our way of doing it, it was just, we didn't want to do that. The second amazing thing that we learned was that make what you control faster. And that's when we came up with our JavaScript loader and that's really what gave us a whole lot of uh, bang for our buck. That's when we um, created something that, from everything that we've learned and all the problems that we ran into uh, a couple of years back, we put it all into this JavaScript uh, loader object or class. So how, this is how it works. The moment the user comes to a page, you serve over the wire a very simple skeleton page that has all the markup that the user needs to see something going on on the page and the, the CSS that the user needs to, that the markup needs to look nice to the user, basically. But just the bare minimums, if you will. Just a bare minimum. So, and, and then, as the browser, so I'm the browser and I'm parsing this page, I'm running into all of these components that in the past would, we would render right away or we would um, subscribe to an on-dom ready or on load to, to render it. But now I'm the browser and as I'm coming across all of these components, these components are registering themselves with me, the browser. All, there's, all, all, the, all they're doing is telling me what they need and what code that I should be running for them later and the priority that they have. And at the bottom of the page when I'm done parsing the whole page, then I go back and render all of these registered components. So this is how it works, really. We have like X amount of components on the page, 
each time the, when the browser approaches, uh, approaches those components, each component will say, hey, I need YUI carousel model to, a module to work, and here's my code, and by the way, I need to be rendered right away because you know, I'm above the fold or whatever, and you know, I'm, a, I'm an important uh, component. So you're declaring your dependency there. When, I, when you say, when the component says, hey, I need YUI, or I need flash.js, or I need X, Y, and Z, what the, what the component is doing is it's declaring the dependency dependencies it needs to the browser. And once it does that, it goes ahead and submits its own functionality, you know, which is basically the code it needs to run. And also it sets its own priority. And the reason we came up with the priority is that we're very SEO centric. And some of the, some of the mechanisms we use to, um, to enhance our SEO ranking is, for example, our header. Sometimes we put the header markup at the bottom of the page, but we need to render it as fast as possible at the top of the page. So because of things like that, you want it to, you want it to set a priority for that specific markup snippet. So it, regardless of where it exists in the flow of the markup, you, you want the, the browser to, ex, um, to execute it in a particular order. So in code, basically, it works something like that. So our page setup object is, is a very small JavaScript object that lives at the top of the page and acts like the registrar office, if you will. So every component pushes all their dependencies to that object, and then they add a control, which is the functionality that they need rendered, and they set that to a specific priority. So once the browser is done with all of that stuff, at the bottom of the page, it goes, in, it goes to uh, include all of these dependencies that all of these components requested. One of the things that we had in the old site, which was really, really, really bad, was that we had multiple requests for the same resource. So for example, YUI, uh, the Yahoo core.js, we sometimes on some pages, it was included nine times. So which was you know, a nightmare because of the way the CMS worked, it had all of these separate components and each developer would say, oh, for my component, I need YUI. And the other guy is saying, I need YUI. And sometimes these components exist on the same page, but because they don't know what they're doing, you know, each component doesn't know what the other is doing, they request the same resource, which was really, really bad. Add, add to that, on top of that, we didn't have caching, so each request would be a real request that would go out. So we decided that regardless of how many resources or dependencies each component is asking for, we need to eliminate all the, the duplicates. So that's the first, uh, first thing that we do, or the browser does, it eliminates the, the duplicate. And then you lo we load all the dependencies in ser uh, serially in all browsers except for Firefox 3.6, I leave an earlier, because now with the new Firefox, um, the Firefox 4, it actually loads when you inject several dependencies or JavaScripts uh, when you request them in, in the DOM, it executes them without paying attention to the order in which they were uh, injected in the DOM, which was really a bummer for us because we, we counted on that for, um, in Firefox at least. Because in our code base, we have a lot of dependencies between the JavaScript files, and we really wanted the browsers to download them in parallel, but execute them in the order that we injected them in the DOM, for God's sake. So, and that was not the case. But anyway, I digress. But um, for our new JavaScript loader, though, we are gonna, we're eliminating this uh, dependency completely. So once you download all the dependencies that all of these objects requested, you, you execute the functionalities, the, you know, the rendering uh, portion of things. And that's when we go ahead and, and merge all these um, functionalities based from high to normal to low, all in one array. And then we go ahead and um, get one, uh, execute one array, uh, one, one function at a time. And this actually, if you guys are not familiar with this set timeout function, it's actually a function that Nicholas Zaka has blogged about, I think in the er early 2009 or something like that. And that was his way of um, executing long running scripts without timing out in browsers. And because we had a ton of components on the page, we did not want to use a for loop, otherwise you will get this timeout uh, message in IE and, and Firefox and all of that. 
So this was a way of kind of giving the browser a breather for, for 25 milliseconds, and then you get the, then you pop, you pop out the next function and you execute, and you pop out the next function and you execute it every 25 milliseconds. And the reason we chose the 25 milliseconds was because it was the safest interval that did not choke IE. When we, try, when we tried 15 milliseconds, IE still hung. You know, it's, it's, it froze when, when we ran that code. So 25 milliseconds seemed to be the, the sweet, sweet spot that worked for us. So now what's going on is the JavaScript loader goes to your, the, functional, function, the function array and pops a function, executes it, 25, waits for 25 milliseconds, pops another function, executes it, and so forth. But that, doesn't, that is not dependent on the previous function finishing. So some functions could be working in, in parallel, if you will, which was really exciting because um, we didn't, you know, that's kind of like a byproduct of, of, the, of that function. I'm not going to take any credit for it. I, I, when Nicholas talked about it, I thought, man, this would apply beautifully to what we're trying to do. So we applied it. The third amazing thing that we learned is to treat everything else as a block. Oh, go ahead, sir. Sorry. I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Oh, if, if one of your components does a document dot write, would that be the page? Oh, none of our components do document dot document write. Your component that adds that does a document dot write. No, yes. Well, the question is what if one of the components uses document dot write? The thing is, because we do this in, uh, in, you know, independently from the onload and the on-dom ready events, we could not have anything in our component code that uses document dot write. But for ads, we c this is where we treat it as a black box, um, because most of our components actually render or start rendering after the unload event is fired and the page feels feels like it's done to the user. So treating everything as a black box, we looked at these guys and we said, you know what, forget it. Black box them, we're not gonna worry about them. So this is basically the way it works with third party. The browser runs across, comes, parses the page and runs across a component. It checks to see, that's the JavaScript loader logic right there. It checks to see if that component is uh, an admins component or something that we have control over. If yes, then make it register itself you know, based on the three-step process I just talked about. If not, if this, third, uh, if this component is a third-party component, then let's check to see if it's an iframe. If it uses iframe, create a placeholder and make it work through the, through the uh, JavaScript loader, it's through the, the regular process. Because with iframes, all we need is to create a, uh, an iframe tag without the source attribute set, and then pass to the loader or register a function that would set that, um, that attribute later on through the JavaScript loader with this priority low or priority normal or whatever you want it to be. So that's fine, that's why we love iframes. But for the JavaScript guy, we have a different approach. We create the placeholder, we register, the, we register that component with, the, with, the, um, with, with our JavaScript loader, but as a completely different component, not as an admins component, but as a third party component. And that, that means that when our JavaScript goes, uh, when our JavaScript loader goes through it, it doesn't really touch it because it's not, it's not part of this uh, pool of components that we, we're handling. But the way it handles it, the, the, you know, the, way, the way it's different, the way it handles it is that once it, it encounters a third party or a JavaScript uh, component at the bottom, it includes it at the very bottom of the page. It calls it in a hidden div. And then when that specific resource is loaded, it removes the original request from the DOM and then copies the node within the hidden div and puts it where it's supposed to be, where it puts it where the placeholder is. And I'll show you how that's done. So that's, that's where you get your placeholder. I'm not gonna talk about the iframe because it's simple. You know, it just, it's handled the way we, I just talked about in previous slides. But for the JavaScript, part of it is, um, is different, and that's how it works. You create your um, placeholder, and you register the details. And the details I need from that component is, what is the placeholder ID that you just created? And I wanna know 
what is the URL, what is that JavaScript URL that you're trying to request. And that's it. At the bottom of the page, I go ahead and grab that. So at that time, at the bottom of the page, I might have like four of these JavaScript objects registered with the, with the browser. So what I do right now is I go through that object and I embed, I create a, a hidden div and inside that hidden div I request the resource, the JavaScript resource. And what's not here that you will see if you look at our source code, we have also an onload um, an unload a function defined. So when that resource is loaded, it takes it and puts the resource back where it's supposed to be. I'm just going to stop here for a sec. I feel like there's a lot of questions, people with a lot of questions. I'm going to stop here for a sec. Do you guys have any questions so far? I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm not saying that it's putting a div. Yeah. And if this is an ad that comes from like double click or some other place and it doesn't document that right, it was still to You're saying that we're the document that right is still gonna be executed? Yes. Because we're injecting that in the markup before the HTML uh, tag is closed. So we yeah, it will take it will take its time. So is that what you're asking? I'm sorry, what if you can come to the mic, oh, I would really appreciate it. I'm trying to compensate for my hearing. I'm just saying that if this is actually an ad call and you just mic. Start, 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 yes. start running it, and if it comes back and later on doesn't make document that right, and it's running the, in the same DOM, it's right. kill the rest of the page you, You're trying to move it around, but by the time you move it around, you won't have a chance to move it around until the page I don't care when it's done, yeah. do, with it's doing it, right. the hidden bit, it will just do it. Hmm. I'm not really sure. So he's he's asking the question is that when that document dot write comes back with other document dot writes and it keeps doing that, that would kill the page automatically for me. So what we have done is we include all of that stuff after the JavaScript loader started rendering the register components that we talked about. So we have not run into situations where an ad was was bad enough in a hidden div that was hanging the the page. Is that what your concern is? That's a good question. I, we have not run into that. We've run into situations where the ad never came back and the unload would never, never fired, but the rest of the page rendered fine. And the other thing is because you're moving it below all the visible DOM elements. Right. If it has some long kind of blocking behavior, at least it's not blocking any visible elements. Right. You talk about trying to get some HTML into the page as quickly as possible. Right. Probably the ad is like here on the page, and if you had the ad right there, it would block the everything else. Blocked, at least. Right, right. So uh, Steve was saying that because we have all of the stuff at the very, very bottom of the page below all the visible elements or the elements that we're interested in rendering, it w if, if it would block anything, it would block everything that's below it, which is really not, not a whole lot, or the requests that are being made in the background. But to be honest with you, we've never, never had a problem with this. So we're lucky us, I guess. So what we learned in this whole process was you cannot control everything, which is really, you know, it's okay, and you, know, you just live with that, it's fine. I know we try to always over-engineer things, and certain things you, it's better to leave alone. Make what you can control fast, and that was really good for us because the 25 millisecond interval for just going at it and rendering these, um, these objects or these components, regardless of the on DOM ready, regardless of the unload event, was extremely helpful for us. And it, it, it proved to be very, very, made the page very responsive to the user, and that's our main goal. And also treat everything else as a black box. Treat everything you have no control over as a black box and in a separate process, like what we're doing with the JavaScript requests. And that, because we, we're, don't forget, we're trying to mitigate the impact of that component that we have no control over. We, we're not trying to eliminate the impact completely because when we try to do that, we failed. So for the insideline.com, which is a very rich site with a lot of flash, a lot of um, photography, and a lot of videos, this is what we yield. And by the way, these images that you're seeing 
being requested bef between the on DOM ready and the on load are those, those are uh, visible images because we wanted to send as much as possible to the user and have things rendered to them right away. But if the images existed below the fold, we would not render them, we would not request them until the user started scrolling down and then we would request them. So we tried to include some intelligence, some sort of intelligence there to, to handle that. And that was huge. Go ahead. Where'd you get these awesome screenshots? That, and these screenshots are from webpagetest.org, which is, which is an amazing tool. By the way, if you don't know this tool, you need to check it out. It's, it's great. Both of, both of these uh, screenshots are from there. Thank you. So as far as we're concerned, the inside line redesign objective you know, was met. We were, we were able to create faster pages, at least much faster than the pages we had in the past. Uh, we were able to deliver richer content and the revenue hasn't been impacted at all. Actually, what we noticed over time is that the ad impression variance, which is the difference between the numbers we, we report on and the numbers that the ad agency tells us that we served has decreased by 3%, which is not a lot, but it's still a positive, you know, it's a move in the right direction. And then, after all of that, living with the inside line for a year and a half and seeing really, really positive uh, results from it, then came the, you know, the real test, if you will. We had another vision, which is to redesign the Edmunds.com site, which is really our bread and butter. So that was the real test for everything that we've built. So we said, you know what? Are we confident with everything that we built? We, you know, I think we, I think we are now in hindsight. But this, is, this was a real test for everything that we've built. We put it on, on the site that is our bread and butter, that if something breaks, we're basically, I won't get paid, and a whole lot of people won't get paid. So we did, and that's what we got. That's the difference between legacy and redesign. By applying the same principles that we did and the same infrastructure that we had uh, built with, uh, with the inside line redesign, everything that we did applied it to Edmunds.com. And as you can see, it's a huge, huge difference. And they're comparable because we didn't really introduce new data sets. We didn't make the new site fancier or anything. It's the same. We're serving the same data. We're, we're, we're providing the same functionality, if you will, and the same value to the end user, but in a difference, in a smarter way. So as you can see, from the Edmunds legacy, it took 8.4 seconds. The new site is, on average, takes 1.9 seconds. And the reason I say on average is because we're doing, we're doing a lot of A-B testing on the new site. And I need to reiterate that we're mitigating the impact of ads. We're not eliminating the impact. So by mitigation, we cannot really control how, you know, how they're going to be responding. So sometimes they respond really well and sometimes they don't. And if they don't, we get the 1.9 seconds. Go ahead. Go back a slide. Sure. So a lot of times when people show charts like this uh, with the before and after, right. they've done things between the before and after other than performance improvements. Like they cut the number of images by 50% or something like that. Right. And you said something like the content's about the same. We can obviously see the content looks very different. Right. But the other thing to me that makes me a little, although I just want to, you know, believe your numbers. Right. Uh, that makes me a little skeptical is the number of bytes. I don't quite know this bytes in, um, but I'm guessing that's like the total number of bytes downloaded mm -hmm. is like a third mm -hmm. in the redesign. Right. Can you explain how it's basically the same content but a third bytes? Right. That's that's a great question. Did everybody hear the question? I don't. I hope I don't need to repeat. Yeah. 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 <laughs> exactly right. Thank you. <laughs> so okay. So that's a great question. In legacy, we had a lot, don't forget, we built legacy or it was redesi redesigned in 2006. And at the time, we had a lot of markup going on. We, it was everything was in the markup, served right from the server. We didn't have anything that was done in JavaScript and done intelligently. So what we're doing, and even though you're saying that the content looks different, it, maybe it looks different, but the, 
the value or the data that we're providing the user is basically the same. We're actually having more, a little bit more functionality on the new site, but not that, not by much. You still can get to the used cars and used car, uh, new and used cars from the old, from the new site, but in it, it's in a different, it's in a different way. So the the reason we did it, as you mentioned, uh, as you mentioned, by combining uh, the images. In legacy, even the smallest icons were their own files. You have no idea. I mean, we, had, we were serving like a bajillion images that were so tiny and small. That all went away. Some of them went, uh, uh, were converted in data URIs. Some of them were uh, put in sprites. So there was a lot of compression and elimination of needless markup and needless code that we did for the redesign that was not thought of in, in the new site. So, and that's maybe where you see the difference in the kilobytes. Does that explain a little answers, answers your question? Okay. Any more question before I continue? So the third party divs you were creating to, like, to load the third party ads into, I was noticing why it was document dot write faster than doing like a pen or something? Or? So the question is when we did it for the third party ads, when we put them at the bottom of the page to include them, why did we use document.write? That just creates a div and passes an ID and then call that over and over. Right. Don't forget, those call, that call, let me go back to where it was. This is it, right? Okay. That call that we're making, that call almost invariably has a document.write in it. Right? We wanted to make sure, because document.write gets executed right away. Once, you, once it's requested, we do not want to be fancy in terms of like, oh, let's inject it in the DOM and let it see, let, let's see how it, how it does. Let's, see, let's use the same you know, statement that that code that's coming back is using. Let's just document.write it in there and let it, let it you know, go to town, let it do what it wants. We do not want to interfere here at all. So we used the same logic. And actually, if you notice, we, we have two separate script tags here. And we had to do that because we closing the, the hidden div, if you put that statement within the first script tag, sometimes the ads, if you have nested document.writes, it will spill over and outside the hidden div if you, put, if you write it in the same script tag. So the, the first script tag had to kind of had to be executed and finish executing before the second script tag is, is executed. Don't forget, these script tags are kind of like blocking requests. So when the second script tag is executed, we are guaranteed that everything that the ad needs is on the page, that no further requests are being made, at least not, no further requests are, being, are gonna be injected into the DOM. So to answer your question, it probably is, might be a better solution, but we did not want we did not want to interfere with the ads. Black box it. Use whatever they use, you know, to speak their language, if you will. Go ahead. Does that answer your question? I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, no, no. So then I think I missed the step after this happens. Because this div is displayed now. Do you just uh, copy the inner HTML or just right. take the div element and, and move it? Right. So, so what's happening here is we have two divs, right? We have the ID cache and the ID root. So what we do here, you, you see the two divs? So the ID cache is just the, the hidden div that encapsulates everything. The ID root div is what we copy. That's the node, that's the kind of like the root that we copy and inject it. We don't do inner HTML, we, we actually copy the root itself and uh, append it to the placeholder that we have. Bef but before we do that, and I need to stress on that, we remove the original call. Because if you don't remove the original call that you made, you will end up with double uh, impressions in IE. It will call it again because you're injecting into the browser. Does that make sense? And I'll be around, obviously, afterwards. I can walk you. I can show you in the, in the, in the code itself how it, all of this is done. All right. So we applied it to Edmonds, and we got amazing results. And we have 20% increase in page views per session, which is huge. I mean, that really proves that engagement increased. And we cannot take, as far as engineers, all the credit for that because the site was redesigned a little bit. I mean, the look and feel is completely different. 
but we know from everything that we've played around with from our A-B testing that performance makes a huge difference in user engagement for us and from everything that we've learned from the community that it is, I mean, there's a direct correlation to it. And again, as, as I mentioned, the discrepancy between ad impressions from what we, we report and the ad agency reports is decreased. Bounce rate, which is another one of our metrics for two, th 2011, is to really reduce, dramatically reduce the bounce rate. And it's been reduced by 4%. I'm happy with that. <laughs> So in the works, in the future, what we're working on right now that we're really excited about is a completely different JavaScript loader. You know, we've, we've created the JavaScript loader. It served us really, really well, but it still has its shortcomings, right? Like the seri serially downloading the dependencies was something that we, I was really not happy with. So what we're working on right now is separating the downloading and of the dependencies from the execution of the dependencies. So we want to download them still in parallel, but we want to control when to execute them. And we want to execute them on demand. And I know Steve has, has worked on Control.js, and we looked at that. We're probably going to build on that. But I know that the community at large is, is working towards that. And we also want to, we're working on creating component level metrics. Because we believe the onload event is, is great as, as a metric to know like, how responsive your page looks or feels to users. But we also want to know when a specific component is rendered to the user. For example, if, if the component is the, the, the header, uh, the navigation header, if that is rendered, we want it to be rendered right away. And we don't know that right now. We don't know if, it's, if it is rendered right away or, or it's rendered after another component is rendered and so forth. So we need those timing mar uh, marks, if you will, markers. And also uh, many other enhancements that I don't want to talk about just because to be secretive. And also we're going to open source. I, I know I, I promised Ryan that I'm going to unveil the JavaScript loader when I talk to you guys. But for reasons outside of my control, I could, I could not get it to GitHub in time. And I'm sure, I'm sure you guys know that. Uh, or familiar with that concept. But very soon it's going to be up. Uh, the old JavaScript loader is going to be up, and we're going to be introducing changes and, and the enhancements in the GitHub project. So this is all great for what we've done in the past. But what I'm really excited about to talk a, uh, to talk a little bit about today is the future and where we're going in the future. And one of it is how we're going to take all these three amazing things that we just talked about and apply it to Mobile. We are creating a mobile, a mobile presence, a web mobile experiences at Edmonds. And we know, like for example, using data URIs and all of that stuff, we, we know what to do in a way and how to apply what we did for the wired site to mobile. But I'm pretty sure there are different rules that apply to mobile than, than those that apply to the wired. And what are those rules? And that's what I'm looking to to work with you guys and the community at large to kind of figure that out as we go. We don't have the answers yet. We're, we're trying to figure them out. And we also, turning into, we're, I'm, I'm spearheading this Edmonds platform initiative, which is a really interesting place to be in because we're moving from third party consumers and that mindset to becoming actually a third party provider. As you can see here, we're, we're going to be creating syndication, uh, syndicated uh, widgets that are going to be working on, that are going to be plug and play, some of them, and some of them are going to be managed. We're going to be working on providing APIs to the rest, uh, to, to in-car computing, to mobile devices, and all of that stuff. So, so this full circle that we're in is really interesting, interesting because we've been complaining all the, all the time about third party, you know, third parties are not doing the right thing and all of that stuff. And now we're going to be in that hot seat. So what are we going to do in order to be good Samaritans out there and not interfere with other people's sites and their performance? So a lot of stuff went on here. And there's, there's more exciting things that we're doing at Edmonds. So please, let's continue the conversation. Um, and work together to make the web uh, in all its forms a faster place. So thank you very much. It's been such a treat. I appreciate it.